All right, you're good. And a very good afternoon. On behalf of everybody associated with the NADP program office and the Central Analytical Laboratory, welcome to our continuing series of webinars today entitled Summarization and Site Maintenance. If this is the uh, first opportunity that you've had to join us for our uh, teaching webinars, uh, welcome and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we will put up a website here momentarily that will show you uh, a address where you can get into and watch previous uh, webinars that we've held. So uh, if uh, you've never seen one, then uh, that gives you the opportunity to refer back. Uh, my engineer for today is Brian Kirshner. He's the assistant data manage manager for the NADP project. My name is Jeffrey Pribble. I'm working site support. If at any time throughout this webinar today you have questions because we're kind of an impromptu bunch, and we want to uh, kind of uh, encourage uh, discussion if we can. If you have any questions, then go ahead and type it in. Uh, we'll read it out aloud and try to get you the best answer that we can. So without further ado, thank you once again for joining us, and let's get started. First slide there, Brian. As I said, the title of today's webinar is called Summarization and Site Maintenance. Obviously, uh, some of us uh, look forward to the summarization part more than others. Uh, you there south of the Mason-Dixon line, I know you had a lot of uh, snow and ice, uh, the folks in the Carolinas, Texas, and stuff like that. Uh, so uh, this is a, a welcome time of year for you as well. But during, the, uh, during those torrential uh, rains and ice and snow, uh, the equipment does take a lot of abuse, so uh, that's why we're holding this uh, webinar today entitled what it is. Next slide, please. Today we want to cover siting criteria and site maintenance, collector checks, uh, gauge cleaning and summarization. Uh, we're going to do something on power checks and then have some uh, other issues and review that we'll do. And like I said, if at any time you have a, a question, don't hesitate to stop. We can stop right in the middle. You do not have to wait till we're finished with today's uh, presentation to ask your question. In ADP siting criteria, when your site was first started or thought about uh, putting in the NTN site, whether it be the NTN or the Mercury or the Airmon, there's certain criteria and uh, rules and guidelines that need to be followed. As you look at this slide, we make certain recommendations as to uh, the rules that have to be followed that will, you know, lead to good valid samples. You, as you look through this, uh, we have certain rules, and I'm not going to go through and read all these along the guidelines and rules, but familiarize yourself with them. These are all things that had to be taken into consideration when your site was first set up. Now, things do happen after sites are set up uh, where you can have, you know, something gets built or a road gets put in or a tree gets, you know, to where it was just a little sapling when you first started. Now it's grown into a big boy or a big girl tree. And uh, we have to do something with that that would uh, potentially uh, cause a violation of the siting criteria. So familiarize yourself with this and let us know if something has uh, occurred that could uh, cause a uh, problem with the potential uh, validation of samples. Next slide, please. These are our two collectors. Uh, the first topic we really want to talk about, and I could talk all day on this. These are certain recommendations that we have. Obviously, you know, I'm, you know, taking pictures from our Bonville field site that's surrounded by uh, corn fields and bean fields. Uh, so the, you know, access to and from can be a little bit easier than somebody that has to go trekking up a mountain or trekking down a mountain or driving for an hour. So these are, once again, recommendations that we make. Um, but then we also have to take into consideration what you as operators have to go through. So uh, uh, we'll talk about that as well. If you have certain instances that you would like to share uh, with other operators during today's webinar, don't hesitate to maybe write it in, uh, type it in, and I can uh, read it, and then we can maybe discuss that a little bit as well. The two collectors that we use here in the NADP project, the NTN network, are the AeroChem collector and the Incon collector. The AeroChem collector is a two-bucket collector that has a wet and dry side and a seven-grid sensor. The newer 
collector that is being introduced. And now I believe we have over 82 of them within the network right now is a one bucket collector that is operated by a optical sensor. And as we progress through this webinar, we will talk a little bit about both and keeping both updated and maintained and summarized. Next slide, please. Site maintenance, uh, one thing that we really want to talk about and stress is the vegetation. Uh, keeping things kind of clean around your collector can take away from potential contaminants, things happening uh, around your collector. As you can see a photo of this right here, this is a collector out at our Illinois 11 field site. The grass has actually grown up underneath the collector a little bit, and that's okay. We want to try to keep the grass or whatever is underneath the collector less than two feet or 60 centimeters. Uh, so any sort of grooming that you can do around the collector uh, to kind of keep things in an orderly fashion is much appreciated and can take away from potential contaminants. Be real careful when you're doing the grooming of your uh, around your collector. Uh, weed whackers have been notorious for cutting power uh, cords, uh, event recorder wires, and stuff like that. So you really have to take into consideration how much you want to get in there and really go to town with your weed whacker uh, in doing site maintenance. I can't tell you in my tenure here how many times I've had an operator, and I have actually did it to my, I did it myself, uh, where I got a little crazy with the weed whacker and cut a event recorder line and had to rewire it. So be very, very careful. Also during your site maintenance as uh, the seasons progress, be real careful of, uh, of flying insects. Uh, we get wasps, we get bees, uh, things like that. They can get into that grass or like to make nests underneath these collectors. So be very, very careful in your maintenance and the vegetation. Next slide, please. Um, the slide to the left, as I made mention a moment ago, uh, less than two feet is our vegetation, what we recommend. Uh, the one on the left is a little overkill. It's, you know, it's gotten real high. This is where with the winds picked up uh, when you've got vegetation this high and the winds whipping through the prairie like we get here in Illinois, then you get a lot of flying material. So what we would like to do, as I said, keep it less than two feet. This is off away from the potential site, but this is a kind of example of things that we do not want growing uh, around the collector uh, for this. We have a question, so if I could stop for just a moment. The question is, is it okay to use a short piece of conduit to shield or protect the wires? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we ask that a lot of the sites, when they are installed, uh, that the wires that are going from the rain gauge to the collector, from the collector to the power source, be put in conduit uh, to protect it from the elements and uh, from the potential. So if you have a way to wrap any wires around conduit and protect it from what I just talked about, then feel free. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give me a call at the 800 number, which I'll show you momentarily, and we can talk about it. Or if you feel comfortable in going ahead and doing it, knowing that it will not uh, cause any issues with the site, uh, then uh, feel free to do so. The picture to the right is kind of an overkill. Uh, as I said, when you're cutting down the vegetation around the site, what you want to do is you want to leave a little bit of grass there. Uh, the photo on the right is it's mowed down to really the nub. And what can happen is as the wind whip around it can pick up that dry grass and blow it around and introduce a source of contamination. So if you can kind of uh, avoid cutting your grass around the collector itself down that low, then that takes one variable out of the mix for potentially contaminating the sample. This is overkill, as I, I like to use that word. That's the third time I've used that word today, overkill. This is, uh, I saw this picture on there. Uh, we ask that you really uh, keep a site well-groomed, but this is, uh, this is a gentleman that's carrying it a little bit to the extreme. I saw this on there and I, I thought it'd be a cute picture. So we ask a lot in your site maintenance and upkeep on the vegetation, but, uh, this is getting a little carried away, so I thought this was kind of a funny picture to add. But I know a lot of guys that like to keep their yards pretty well groomed. And uh, I don't know, I, thought, I always think a mower might work a little bit better than just a pair of scissors.
The parts of the AeroChem collector that I want to talk about, we'll talk about this, the AeroChem first, that's the two bucket collector before we get into the Incon collector, which is a one bucket. Familiarize yourself with the front of the motor box. This is the, the piece of equipment that sits underneath the collector itself. Um, when problems exist where the collector will not go back and forth like it should, and you call in and I ask you, have you done this? Have you done this? It's familiarized. It's good if you familiarize yourself with how the motor box is laid out. And we have it labeled there to the right. And thank you very much to Brian as he uh, did a lot of the incorporation of the, uh, uh, of the motor box itself. Uh, descripting um, some collect, you know, some sites are run on AC only. Uh, some sites have AC with a battery backup. Uh, there, we have a few sites that run on DC. And then our next webinar that we will have in July will actually be about uh, DC and solar power. And we do have a fair amount of sites that, uh, uh, that run off solar power, and we want to get into that. But when we talk about whether the site is, uh, you call me up and you say, well, I can't get the collector to open or close. And one of the first things I'm going to ask you is, have you checked, have you taken your voltmeter and have you checked the fuses? Uh, check the continuity of the fuses and go from there. Uh, just the site maintenance as you look at it coming out of winter into spring and from spring or from fall going into winter is make sure that, you know, everything looks like it's attached. You'll have event recorder wires going into the terminal strip uh, like it should. And you want to make sure those screws are nice and tight. Uh, if you're not using a DC fuse or any sort of DC, uh, the one, the upper right-hand corner of the face of the motor box on the picture to the right, 12 volt DC is a good place to keep a spare fuse. Uh, you know, that's uh, a lot of times, uh, just recently, as of yesterday, I had an operator call me up and ask me, uh, my box will not work. I asked them if they checked the continuity of the fuse, and they said no. They did. The fuse was bad. They were about 30 minutes from town, what to do. And I said, borrow the fuse from the DC side, and they were able to get their collector working, and then you replace it your next trip out. The uh, glass fuses that we use in these are the half-amp, the two amp slow burn fuses. It's always nice to keep two or three around uh, at your site in case something were to happen. Any questions up to this point? Sensor cleaning. What can happen over the time, uh, sitting out in the sun, uh, you know, a lot of precipitation, uh, snow, rain, birds love to sit on the these sensors. Uh, so what can happen is in the lower right-hand corner, you'll see the top of the sensor. It has the seven grids. It sits on a, a metal plate. The, underneath that metal plate is an ambient heater. So when precipitation occurs and lands on the plate of that ambient heater, then it it's, causes a collector to open and close. Uh, what can happen, as I said, seasonally is uh, get lots of bird dew, uh, whatever, but you can build up a residue on top of that sensor plate that can actually cut down on the sensitivity of the sensor. So from time to time, I may ask you, uh, you say, well, it's not near as sensitive as I think it would be. I might ask you to clean it before we think about changing it out because cleaning it may improve your sensitivity and your collection efficiency because we do ask that it, you know, try to be within the 5% between the gauge and the bucket. In the upper left-hand corner, you're going to see a yay and a big no-no. There's a bottle of isopropyl alcohol there uh, that I sometimes ask people to use, or you can use deionized water to clean the sensor grid. To the left, you have a real strong bristled brush. On the right-hand side, you'll see the gold part, and that's a brass or a, a brass brush. Uh, do not use that. We do not want to in any way uh, scar up the plate of the sensor and scratch it up, that can really mess up the sensitivity of that. So that was kind of why I put that brush in the in the picture. It's got a good side and it's got a bad side. So always make sure that you use, I recommend a uh, hard bristled uh, toothbrush. Uh, keep that handy as well. Uh, things to keep kind of handy at the site, um, as I said, fuses, a toothbrush, 
uh, either some deionized water or some isopropyl alcohol. Uh, I said fuses. What else was I going to say? Chem wipes. Uh, voltmeter, I think I covered. But there you see also something else to take into consideration. When you're doing your sensor cleaning, you'll see at the end of the sensor to the picture just above uh, the grid itself is a cannon plug. Uh, that goes into the face of the motor box and always, uh, you know, on occasions, check to make sure that that is nice and tight. Uh, it's a female going into the male plugs that are onto the motor box, so you want to make sure that those are nice and tight and uh, so that we don't have problems with the sensitivity of the sensor itself. Next slide, please. The underneath part of the uh, AeroChem can be troublesome in so many ways. It's an older piece of equipment. It's uh, the linkages underneath there uh, are, you know, been attributed to the elements. Uh, there's uh, things that can happen over time. What we would like you to do on a biannual basis is take some gum out. Do not use WD-40. WD-40 can draw dirt, grease, grime, and attractants. So what we ask you to do is either use some silicone or some gum out and give the linkages the linkages all the way from the clutch all the way down to the counterweight, the mounting clips, and the dry ro rods a spray, uh, keeping them well lubricated. One real important thing to notice that I want everybody to look at at the conclusion of this when they go out to their site next time, and I just sent out a pair today, are what are called the mounting clips. What happens with the mounting clips over time when the the collector cycles back and forth as those mounting clips can work their way a little ways away from the from the counterweight and from the drive rods themselves. What happens when those come away from your drive rods and your counterweight is it allows them to kind of slide on that on those drive rods and what it can cause is for when the motor box is in motion or the the lid tension spring is in motion and the clutch and the push rod is in motion, it'll hang up. So what will happen is it'll move your lid about halfway uh, and then get kind of hung up a little bit. Uh, if they're missing or broken in any capacity, then we have replacements here. Um, actually, I would love to share a picture that I got from one of our site operators today. Uh, he noticed that he had one that was missing, and he had a couple twist ties from uh, past bucket uh, bags and he tied three twist ties around his drive rod uh, to keep his clutch from or clutch spring from sliding uh, until I could get him and I sent him out today. He'll have them by Friday, but kind of uh, using the old noodle there a little bit for, uh, you know, incorporating something that'll work until you have a temporary fix. But that is very, very, very important to check is to make sure that those are snug up against a counterweight as far as and also against the drive rods because if they are like i said it can cause that uh clutch and the push rod to come away from a 90 degree angle we want it to be at a 90 degree angle there as it sits on the drive rods and if it slides on that drive rod then that's what can cause it to hang up i know i gave you a lot of information there is there any questions and as i said you can take gum out or silicone spray and spray all of that really, really well uh, to keep it lubed up so it'll work better. The Incon collector, uh, ways for adjusting the Incon collector. What you want to make sure of on the AeroChem as well as on the Incon is uh, when the Incon opens, it's going to move off of the bucket and then it sits like on a splash plate. When it comes back, it's going to have like a herky jerky motion before it finally settles in place on top of the bucket as it makes its cycle. If you happen to look underneath there and you see a little bit of a, a gap or it's not completely flush on the uh, bucket like it should be, uh, what you do not want to do is there's a couple of things there that I did, that's my arm, uh, put a glove on. I've got a bucket underneath there, but I'm working in the I'm working in the uh, shop there, so it's not something that's totally, you know, it's going to matter in the shop. But in the field, uh, you have to have a bucket on there, and you do not want to contaminate the bucket in any way. So if you have a glove that you're using during the removal of the sample, take that glove, 
And maybe if you have a sleeve or something, instead of putting your bare arm on the top of that uh, to push it down. But what you want to do is you want to loosen those hex screws enough to where you're able to move that lid down to where it'll show and have nice uh, a sealing, a nice seal against the bucket and then tighten your hex screws back. It's a, it's a pretty good adjustment. You can make that on both sides. And uh, if there's, if you're having a problem with that, contact me and I can send you a uh, more descriptive type of memo on how to uh, go ahead and make those adjustments without just basically looking at this picture. Any questions? I want to stop enough to where I give everybody a time to digest what I've told them. Uh, and also, if there are any questions, don't hesitate to ask. This is a bunch of information. But, you know, when you do your maintenance like this, if you only do it biannually, uh, so be it. But this is something that you kind of take into your consideration uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, be real good at recognizing things that look right, may not look right, because if you can nip them in the bud, as Barney Fife used to say, uh, then, you know, down the road you don't have the bigger problems. One thing to do with the Encon collector, too, as a, as our QA director made a good point, is go around and check all the screws on the on the lid mechanism uh, as far as, you know, making sure everything is tight. Uh, you know, the transition going back and forth, the opening and closing, and the sensitivity of that can sometimes loosen screws. So that's a good point made is to go around and make sure everything is nice and snug and tight, not so over tight that it won't move correctly, but, you know, tight enough that you're not going to uh, run the risk of something falling off. So thank you for that uh, advice there. The Thief sensor. Uh, this is an optical sensor. Uh, the optics are in between that U-shape. It's like a horseshoe. What I've shown everybody here are a couple of things that can happen from long, uh, harsh winters or whatever. Uh, you know, they have a tendency. It's the kind of plastic that can dry out a little bit. So if you have an Incon collector and you have not inspected your thief sensor lately, go ahead and look. Um, kind of one of the things that can happen when you have a problem like this is you'll get massive amount of cycles. We just replaced one of these uh, where the operator only had just a trace of rain, but he had like over 500 cycles because uh, what happened is the moisture got inside there. We ask that if you notice that you're having an issue like this, do not, under any circumstances, open that sensor. Just let us know. We have replacements. We can send them out in a quick, orderly fashion. Uh, if you let us know on a Tuesday, we'll have you the new one by Thursday or Friday. Uh, get it put on and be back in business. But we do not, under any circumstances, uh, want you to open that up. Uh, we look specifically for cracks all the way around and uh, on the housing, whether it be on top, on the side. Uh, it's real important to catch anything that could be in the middle because that's where you break the beam of your optics and uh, it triggers the opening and closing of the collector. So uh, if you could uh, be aware of that and let us know at the uh, next trip out, uh, be much appreciated. Any questions? The sensor replacement, all you have to basically do is uh, you don't have to replace the shaft or anything like that. You just undo the mounting clips, the screw, and the plug that goes underneath. It's uh, it's real simple. We'll send you instructions. If that is the case, uh, get it off, get it on, get it replaced. Uh, one thing to do uh, when I was talking about cleaning the uh, – the sensor, the AeroCom sensor, we kind of want you to do the same thing. Actually, on the Encon collector, we would like you to do, you know, a cleaning of the Encon collector on a weekly basis. You know, this isn't something, but if you got it like a, you know, some uh, Kim wipes, you know, if you notice a little uh, dust or cobwebs or anything like that in between the optical sensor, give that a wipe. You know, wipe it down, make sure everything's clean. The birds like to sit on it. Uh, same goes for your collector lid and around your one bucket. Uh, if you notice stuff that's building up, uh, there's been activity or something like that, uh, it only takes a second, you know, spray a little DI water on there or whatever you have, and uh, a Kim wipe or paper towel and just kind of wipe everything down. I think cleanliness is next to godliness, so uh, like I said, the better you can take care of your equipment, uh, the more friendly it's going to be to you when the, when the temperatures drop and stuff like that, so we appreciate the effort. Any questions?
talking about gauge cleaning, there's not really much you can do with the old Op Plue VO2. What you really want to be aware of when you go to summarize this, and we'll get in advance, opening the RMM, making sure that you're noticing the flash on the, uh, you know, on the data logger, it should flash every 15 seconds. Uh, you know, you want to look at the data logger inside. Make sure that you haven't got any mice that have got in there. Make sure you haven't got any wasps that have got in there and built nests. No cobwebs or anything like that. You just want to open it up, make sure everything looks nice and uh, clean and everything like that. Close it back up. What you want to do for the gauge cleaning as far as the bucket and stuff like that, if you're going from winterization to summerization, and we'll get to that in a minute as far as draining the uh, draining the uh, holding bucket on the gauge is uh, be real careful in removing it off the load cell because, you know, any damage to the load cell can cause uh, precipitation, false precipitation, that kind of thing. We do have a question. Is it okay to spray insecticide on the sensor? No, we ask that you don't spray insecticide anywhere if you uh, can avoid it. Uh, it's one of them things where you never know what you're going to get. Uh, you know, if you get splash or anything like that, I don't know. I, it's just kind of one of them things if you can avoid introducing a potential contaminant around anything that's, you know, being tested as far as the organics and inorganics in our chemistry, uh, try to avoid that. I know it's harsh uh, because you can get some wasp nests and stuff like that. And we've had operators that have gotten stung and stuff like that. So we, we always preach safety, but we also want to preach everything that we can do uh, to avoid contaminating the sample in any way. Next slide, please. Uh, summarization, uh, I'm going to discuss this here momentarily, kind of get more entailed. You can read through that if there's any questions. Don't hesitate to give me a holler. Next one, please, Brian. This is a NOAA 4. Uh, same thing kind of goes. If you remove the outer shell, uh, check it. Make sure that, you know, all the connections are where they should be, uh, that the uh, bucket is sitting on there like it should on the load cell. Uh, no cobwebs or anything like that. Uh, you know, grease, grime, dirt, everything. Uh, anything you can clean, we'll elaborate a little bit more on that as we progress. Next slide, please. And the summarization, it's basically the same as yacht. Uh, there's so many things you can do. Take out the old antifreeze, wipe out the inside of the, the buckets real good. Make sure they get placed back on the load cell to where they're on there in a nice settled fashion on top of the nodules. And so it rests easily. Next slide. Uh, here's the transfer pump. This is what I wanted to show. If you're emptying, emptying out any precipitation or if you're emptying out any sort of antifreeze after the winter, this is our transfer pump that we sent to sites. If you do not have one of these, email me or call me. We'll get you one ASAP. Uh, it's a lot better than trying to remove the shell off of the, uh, off of the gauge and then picking up that big old bucket uh, that's in the op pluvio and trying to find a a good place to dump it. Uh, if you use a transfer pump, you can take it in the discard bucket, cap it, take it to somewhere that's going to be environmentally friendly for you to be able to get rid of it and, uh, you know, be able to uh, discard properly. Proper bucket installation. When you put the bucket back on there after you've removed the shell, here's a, a few do's and don'ts. Uh, a comment was made, and I want to pass this along a real, real quick. Uh, suggestion is to use no, no use of insecticides around the collector. Past testing shows they are very high in chlorides. I worry about overspray. If you must do this due to a bad infestation around the collector, I'd stand well away from the collector, spray a lab, lab wipe, then use it and kind of wipe it down instead of, you know, trying to, you know, have the aerosol spray go who knows wherever. So and then another comment, uh, make certain that the right discard on the bucket. Do not reuse the bucket uh, for sampling uh, when you're dumping your antifreeze uh, with your pump into the bucket. Make sure that you, uh, you know, we know that this does not get back in the mix and it gets uh, rewashed and reused. So uh, please write discard on the side. Uh, proper bucket installation when you're putting the bucket back on. See the on the on the one on the left, uh, the wires that come from the optical sensor on 
the gauge itself are tucked underneath the load cell. Do not put them on top of the load cell like it says in 1B, because when you put the bucket back on, the bucket is going to pinch those wires and it'll break those wires. And then it, basically you have no optical sensor on your gauge. So 2A is correct. You see how it's nice and flat. 2B is incorrect. You can see where it's kind of leaning. Next slide, please. You see 3A correct if you look straight down. You should have an identical circumference all the way around the outside of the catch bucket and the inside of the shell. Uh, 3 and 4A are correct. Uh, 3B and 4B, you can see where there's kind of leaning off to the side. So if there's uh, any problems, uh, you know, doing that, it can cause false precipitation, uh, wind shake, you know, a lot of noise. Uh, so make sure that you got it on there sitting on the load cell properly. I have a question. Will cleaning the interior of my bucket in any way trigger the gauge to log precipitation? If so, how can this be avoided? If you're using the Incon, um, there's a service mode on the PDA. You can put it in the service mode, or if we happen to notice stuff, the data when it's sent in is scrutinized and reviewed. So if you have anything that is not correlate with the openings and closings, uh, what we consider false precip or anything like that, uh, then we remove it. If you have to clean the, uh, take the bucket off and clean the interior with some paper towels and stuff like that, I wouldn't worry about it because once you've uh, removed the sample and everything like that, we know when it ends uh, and when the, you know, the next bucket goes on that starts. So uh, thank you for that question. If I can elaborate any further, uh, let me know. Next slide, please. The old Belfort, whoo, boy, is that a dinosaur. But it's worked for years. Uh, we still have some sites out there that do have the old Belfort, uh, the collection chamber. You can remove the uh, antifreeze the same way. This is one. Uh, if you're to do maintenance on this, and they like to live in uh, in the old uh, insides of the Belfort, uh, the mice, uh, the bugs, the wasps, bees, and everything like that. If you remove the chart drum with the clip and you want to take that gum out and go to town, spray, spray, spray. I would get like a little paintbrush that you use for maybe uh, painting a model car or whatever, you know, some trim in the house. Spray with gum out real, uh, real well, and then maybe take that brush and kind of dust away any grease or grime that's built up in your connections and stuff like that on your gauge. As I said, try not to get the pins, the pin nibs, as you'll see, and remove the chart so you don't get any uh, on the chart. But uh, spray that thing uh, freely and uh, then exercise it. You can take the collection chamber off, lay your hand on that flat platform that the collection chamber sits on and kind of push it up and down. What it does is it exercises the gauge. And then in the process, you can see the precipitation pin arm which is the one on the bottom, it'll go up and down and up and down and you want to be able to see it move freely without any hang up. So uh, just one of the things, you don't have to worry about drying anything off when you put it back together. Make sure that it's not in places that is going to cause a potential uh, smearing of the precipitation rain gauge chart or anything like that and then piece it back together. If there's adjustments, I wanted to point out something and it was a, uh, kind of an oversight on my problem. When you summer or when you winterize and go to summerization, you dump out the antifreeze, you're going to see the precip precipitation pen arm kind of be sitting at the two or three inch level and then it's going to drop back down. If you need to make an adjustment right below where it says collection chamber support shaft, right below the arrow part, you're going to see a little knob. If you turn that knob to the right or left, you're going to be able to see the precipitation pen come up or down. If you are incurring this problem and you want me to specifically send you something that's a little bit closer and descriptive as to what I'm talking about, don't hesitate to give me a holler and I'll send it on to you so we can, uh, after winter, after summerization though, we would like to see the precipitation pen arm sit at about the half inch level. Why the half inch level and not the zero level? Because the fact is, if you get any wind shake, what can happen is it'll knock that precipitation pin arm below the drum, and then you won't collect any precipitation data. So about the half-inch level gives you the buffer, so to speak, for 
any potential wind shaker or something bumping up against it. Okay, they, um, a comment from one of the attendees. We still have a old Belford. I was told years ago to exercise it every week when the chart is removed, push it up and down gently. Yeah, that's good advice. Exercise it exercise it up and down and keeps it, you know, free from gumming up and stuff like that. So thank you for that good advice. Summarization, as I talked about, if you want to read through the range gauge summarization instructions, uh, basically it goes through what I just talked about a little bit. If you want uh, more elaboration, let me know. Next slide, please. One thing to make sure of when you're summarizing your Belfort, put the funnel back in. Uh, if you see the top section of the of the rain gauge there off to the right hand side, you see where the funnel is. The funnel goes on that bottom part there. Actually, one time had a operator put the funnel on the top and was wondering why his precipitation collection efficiency was off. Well, you know how the funnel peaks. And so instead of going down into the bucket, it was on top and it was kind of coned up. So everything that hit rolled down off of the side of the gauge and uh, couldn't figure out for a long time why his collection efficiency was so poor until we got a picture of the gauge and then we were able to determine it right away. So make sure it goes on the bottom part of that top section and uh, right over the top of your collection bucket. The clock, uh, if you haven't changed the battery and the clock, these things are so... Uh, Moody, that's a that's a word. Um, on the left, the Belfort clock for the windy. Windy, you start to feel a little tension. You overwind it, you wind it till it's completely tight. Might as well take it off and send to me uh, because it is does not like to be overwound and it will not run if it's overwound. So please only wind it. It normally takes about 15 to 20 times before you start feeling a little tension. When you get to that part, stop. Uh, for the batteries, change them out biannually. If it's working, sometimes you mess with it and it just quits working. So I say, you know, check the uh, check and change. But if it's working good, I'm not sure I want to mess with it. So that's up to you. Make sure when you put the battery uh, holding, you know, where the battery's at, make sure it does not get in the way of the drum, interfere with the drum turning. Uh, so make sure you kind of tuck that out of the way in the gauge itself. Power checking the batteries. Uh, the batteries, whether they be the backup batteries or they're the batteries in the gauges themselves, uh, load testing them. Uh, when you just lay your voltmeter on there and say, well, I'm getting a reading of about 12.5, that does not necessarily mean that battery is good. What we want to do as far as testing the battery is to do a load test on it. You can take it to the auto parts store at Walmart, O'Reilly's, AutoZone, wherever you have around you. Ask them to do a load test. It's free. Yes, you have to take it off and carry it in. But, you know, there again, if you're having power issues, uh, make sure that, you know, when you're doing stuff, uh, if you're going to charge your battery and stuff like that on the one on the far left-hand side, remove the vent caps. Uh, pressure builds up in that, in that battery acid. You don't want that. It'll heat up. Uh, so use safety. The one on the right, the battery terminals. Uh, for the maintenance-free battery, make sure those are nice and clean. Uh, and then uh, our webinar in July, we'll talk more extensively about battery power and solar power as well. But if you have any questions, once again, don't hesitate to give me a holler. Next slide, please. Uh, just little things. Uh, one of the big reasons that NADP and NTN is what it is is uh, – is our review team uh, led. There's a company called EEMS that goes around to site reviews and make sure everything is, you know, kosher, uh, does everything, cleaning the site, making sure it's level and about everything you can do for a site. This is what this company does and bless the hearts of those associated with EEMS uh, travels the nation going to site to site to site. And uh, if you're on the uh, review list, uh, look forward to seeing those folks from EMS, they're wonderful people and keep our sites running uh, for things I can't answer and necessarily do or you as operators do. Uh, they pretty much know everything from top to bottom. This is just a uh, something that they took during one of their review uh, trips 
most of the time we would like to see that in conduit below ground, uh, just cords, open cords laying like that can be quite a hazard. So let's uh, try to get stuff in conduit uh, so it's not just laying above ground. Next slide. There again, uh, right there you see the electrical for this particular collector. Uh, it's got ice coating it. Uh, the plug is not plugged in all the way. You got some black electrical tape around it. Uh, just introducing safety. Uh, I mean, that's what we stress. If you're introducing yourself to uh, potential for shock, uh, not something I want to do is get 120, 120 into uh, me on a weekly basis. So cut down the uh, opportunities uh, for potential hazards. Next slide, please. Uh, have a question. Do we need to wait for a dry week to siphon the antifreeze out of the Opluvio? No, you don't. You can do it anytime you'd like. Uh, just siphon it out. Uh, we will see the difference. We'll see in your uh, when you send in your data that you've uh, that you've done that, and also make a remark. Uh, anything you do at the site uh, without writing a dissertation or a novel in uh, section ten uh, of your field form, write down what you've done. Uh, your RIs out there. So anything that you've done or you see that may potentially contaminate or cause problems, uh, let us know in that section. And then once again. Yeah, we have the email address where you can call me at the 800 number. This one here is a dandy. Uh, what you can do is you can see the wire that goes from the inside of the, this is a cast net trailer to the outside. So basically you got a bare wire coming across the, uh, across the hinge of this door. And basically it kind of allows that the current is potentially, uh, What's the word I'm searching for here, Brian? Uh, kind of uh, can cause a shock hazard. Let's just leave it at that. Uh, what you want to do is you want to make sure that you've got everything kind of uh, in a safety fashion. Wires like this can uh, cause, you know, a potential shock hazard. when you if, you're, if you've got wet feet and you touch the door handle and you've got a wire like that, it could potentially shock you. So let's uh, take away any perspective or uh, possible things that could happen like that. Uh, this is the optical sensor that goes on the, uh, uh, one of the optics that goes into the gauge. Uh, this is something that if uh, you review it, this is on your, on your NOAA 4 gauge. Uh, if you're noticing that these things have actually slipped out of the holding place, there should be two of them. Uh, when you look on the inside shell of your NOAA 4 gauge uh, and you lift that off and you remove the bucket, you'll see there's two of these down by the load cell. Uh, make sure that these are stationary and still in place. If they've happened to slip out of the position they're in, let us know. Uh, we have a way to go about replacing them. They're a little uh, tedious in replacing, but you know what? You're going to need them uh, for the optical sensors to be effective. Have a question. How often do I need to load test my battery? I do it biannually. Uh, when you come out of a harsh winter, uh, check them. And before you go into the harsh winter, uh, check them again. Uh, you know, there again, uh, if you can keep them nice and uh, fresh, um, how often to change the batteries. If you can get one year out of them, uh, you know, you've done good. Uh, sometimes, depending upon the elements, you'll get more out of that. I've got sites that have gone, you know, two or three years with their batteries. But I've also had sites that, you know, are in the elements of, in the higher elevations of Colorado, Wyoming, that kind of thing, where, you know, if they can get a year out of their battery, they're doing good. Next slide. Uh, the corrosion on these batteries, you know, this just needs taken off, cleaned. Uh, make sure that, you know, this is going to help with your uh, connections and stuff like that, your power sources. So, you know, always try to keep these kind of things clean. Next slide, please. Here's an... Uh, you know, a collector, you could see everything that could possibly be wrong in violation is wrong with this collector. Uh, weeds are high. They've grown up to where they're almost at the top of the collector. Uh, the collector's not closed all the way, so it's just exposing that bucket uh, for potential contamination. Who knows how long this has been like that. So if this is something that you got going on at your site, uh, give me a holler. Let's fix this. I mean, a, a fix is going to be fairly easy. Let's... Uh, Make sure that we stay within the protocol and the rules of the uh, NADP. Next slide, please. 
We are going to be sending you out new uh, lid seals. They're going to come with uh, the uh, what's now a Teflon cover. Uh, the whole idea behind this is not to have to change these things annually. This is an operator that installed his upside down. Uh, we want the Teflon part to go down. If I can get Brian to throw me the camera back over here, I'll show you what it looks like. It's not much different than the plastic coating that you're used to. So bear with us for just a second. We get the old camera back. Thought you were going to only have to see me once today, but. Okay, this is, this is what the Teflon lid seal looks like. This is the side that we want to go down towards the bucket. This is the side we want away from the bucket. You can obviously tell the difference. One side's got the Teflon tape and the metal plate. This one is what we want sitting on the bucket as it goes back and forth, whether you have a, this is uh, set up for the AeroChems. Uh, we have the Incon sites already having the Teflon lid seals on. So now we're going to uh, work on getting all the AeroChems set up for the Teflon lid seal as well. So if there's any questions, these will be coming out shortly as soon as I get it in gear and get these things produced and I have some help. So they'll be coming your way. Uh, with a installation memo here any day now. And we'll go back to the next slide. And once again, uh, questions or comments, if you have anything that comes to mind, uh, don't hesitate to give a call, 1-800-952-7353. You can fax us information uh, if you have uh, you know, field forms or data corrections, you can fax it to 217-333-0249. Email me anytime you want, ntn at isws.illinois.edu. Are there any questions? I want to go back to that first slide once again, if we could, Brian, please. The very first slide of the presentation. One more. No, nope, the other way. In the upper left-hand corner, you'll see goillinois.edu forward slash NADP training. If you, as I said in the opening, if this is the first chance that you've had to watch our uh, webinars, uh, then you can go and archive the previous webinars and look through those. If you have a question, give me a holler. Um, this is something that we're going to try to do. Uh, our next one coming up is in July. We're going to talk about battery and solar power. Are there any questions? Uh, did you say to change the lid seal once per year? Yeah, it should be done. Uh, it's normally done the first Tuesday in July, and we're going to try to stay with that. Uh, whether I get them out the door, and I'm going to try very hard to get them out the door, so we can all do that in a orderly fashion on the first week in July. Uh, but they'll be heading your way, and when you get them, they will come in your big. Uh, supply box. Have a couple comments. Is there a basic rule for distance from collector for trees? Seems like when I have a review and audit, I need to cut another tree or something. For the trees, as you see to the side, away from the collector, you don't want anything that's going to overhang. Uh, you need a 45 degree rule. Uh, cultivated fields, fertilizer, that kind of thing, greater than 20 meters as far as trees. Uh, you don't want anything that's going to overhang. Uh, let's see here as you read as I read through this vegetation height less than five meters. You know if it's around the collector, uh, take into consideration the ground slope. If your collector's below where a tree's at, if you're in the mountainous areas, you want to make sure that you know that tree is not overhanging. Uh, if you have the collector above something like that, that's a different story. But uh, take into consideration the terrain. I'll look into that and see if there's a, if something that's in question, give me a holler on that and we can try to get it all situated. Change once a year, even with the yeah, even with the uh, Teflon covering, I thought that uh, that's an internal discussion, but I thought with the introduction of the Teflon coverings, uh, we'll get those sent out. And I believe, I don't know how often those are going to get changed, but there again, you'll be, uh, when it does occur, you'll be first to know. 
Are there any questions? I know we covered a lot of information. Once again, I want to stress that if you have any uh, questions, comments, or anything like that, don't hesitate to call the 800 number, 1-800-952-7353. Okay, if there are no questions, I once again would like to thank you on behalf of everybody associated with the NADP and the National Trends Network. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day for joining us. Thank you to Brian Kirshner for being the engineer. Jeff Pribble saying so long. This has been a production of the Illinois State Water Survey, the NADP, and the Central Analytical Laboratory. Thank you once again for all your continued efforts.